Hello, welcome everyone. This is LinkedIn Live with Patricia Iyer and myself, Barbara Levin. We are here to talk to you about closing the session. I want to introduce Patricia Iyer to you. She is a, an amazing legal nurse consultant leader. She is a national and international icon in the field. And she is a legal nurse consultant certified who also has her master's in nursing. She is past president of the American Association of Legal Nurse Consultants and supports legal nurse consultants as a business coach. She currently helps attorneys and pers on personal injury and medical malpractice cases. Pat is the author of at least 60 books and counting. Her website is legalnursebusiness.com. And it's my pleasure to introduce Barbara Levin, who just gave that lovely introduction. Barbara is an accomplished author. She's certified as a medical surgical orthopedic and legal nurse consultant. She maintains three certifications and testifies on medical surgical and orthopedic cases. Barbara is also a past president of the American Association of Legal Nurse Consultants and volunteered several years of her life to being involved in the Massachusetts Board of Nursing, including a term as the president and chair of that organization, which got involved in licensure issues and um, both for nurses as well as for schools of nursing. It's a pleasure to see you here this morning. And our topic is to focus on when an attorney contacts you, what do you say to help assure that you get the case, that the attorney chooses you? I know that this is a question in the minds of many legal nurse consultants who might get a call from an attorney and then get caught up in an endless game of chasing the attorney to see if the attorney has made a decision. So we're gonna focus on some of the things that you can do on that initial contact so that you've got a much greater chance of being selected as the legal nurse consultant to work on that case. And before the session is over, we'll also share with you some details about the March 23, 24, and 25 conference 2023 coming up. This is our seventh online conference that Barbara and I have planned. And we'll invite you to sign up for this if you're not already signed up. Barbara, I know there are, there are lots of questions that we can field in this program, and we will also encourage you when we ask you for your thoughts to put it in the chat. The phone call uh, comes in, Barbara, and you're answering the phone as a legal nurse consultant. Tell us about some of your responsibilities as the legal nurse consultant in handling that initial phone call. Absolutely. First off, I want to encourage all of you to be friendly. When you hear the phone ring, smile when you pick up the phone. That should make you feel very happy when you're answering the phone. Share your delight that you have the opportunity to speak to a potential client or perhaps a previous client about a new case. I suggest that you be genuinely concerned about the attorney. Recognize that any business person has limited resources, and your goal is to help this attorney make the best use of his resources. And then I'd like you to think in terms of service. What can you do to help the attorney rather than what can she or he do to help you? Your focus should be your client's needs. If you're not the right person for the assignment, then I suggest that you help the attorney by finding someone who is. I don't dream of doing life care plans. For example, I'm not qualified and I would rather find a colleague who's very experienced to help my clients with their cases. That is not a field for me. So it's really important that over the, you will hear today, the, um, 
the strength of networking with your colleagues. Um, but it's so important that you recognize what you're able to do versus what you're not able to do. So if you can't do a case for a variety of reasons, you can refer it to a colleague and you're still assisting your client with that. And what you can also do uh, for those of you who are considering hiring subcontractors, uh, you could work with subcontractors and have contracts with them to work with your attorney clients as well. And you can still make money on that. So we're going to talk in a few minutes about what creates a conflict of interest. Could you, all of you who are attending, please put in the chat one situation or a relationship that you see as a conflict of interest. So I'm gonna look over and see what's being written in here. While you're all writing your comments, Pat, could you discuss some other responsibilities? Sure. You're responsible for believing in yourself. You bring to the attorney a tremendous amount of clinical knowledge and understanding about how the healthcare system works, the ability to be detail-oriented and focused, that knowledge is invaluable to an attorney. So you must be confident in your knowledge and your skills and your ability to help an attorney. In addition, when that phone call comes in, you must believe that you will get the case. You have a positive mindset. You believe that the attorney has contacted you because they are interested in what you can bring to this case and that you have the expectation that this is going to materialize. You can frame this in the phone call of, I look forward to working with you. When the case comes in, the first thing that I will do is this. So you are framing that conversation with the belief that you will get the work. And also, you have a responsibility to know that the attorney is taking a leap of faith in getting you involved, particularly if that attorney doesn't know you. The attorney may have been referred to you. Uh, you they may have gotten your name on a listserv. They've got a tremendous amount of time, money invested in a case before they pick up the phone and ask for help. If you're helping a plaintiff attorney right in the beginning, there may not be a lot of time invested or a lot of money except for getting copies of medical records. But if you're on the defense side, that case is well underway before you get involved. And then the final responsibility is that you can't help the attorney unless the attorney hires you. In other words, don't work for free. I saw a statement about a month ago that an attorney told a legal nurse consultant that LNCs do the work they do because of the goodness of their heart, implying that they don't expect to be paid. That's not business. You don't go to your supermarket and say, I'm a good person. I should be able to get groceries for free this week. That won't happen. You have to be able to have a billing arrangement. You have to have retainers. You have to set reasonable fees, which we'll talk about in the course of this program. And Barbara, I think there are a couple of comments coming in about conflict of interest. So let's talk about that in relation to the questions that you need to ask an attorney about the case when that initially comes in. And then also we can focus on the conflict of interest responses that we've gotten in the chat. Absolutely. Um, so first off, I'd like to suggest that you listen when the phone call comes in, take notes, ask questions. And I recommend that you develop some type of new file intake, a template that you'll consistently use and it can capture all the critical details of the matter at hand. So there are certain questions that you're going to want to ask. And this reminds me of English class back in the day, many years ago. The who, what, where, when, and even why, or how, if you even know that. 
So who is the plaintiff? Who is the defendant? Where did this happen? When did this happen? When do you need my assistance? What is your deadline? And you can go on from there. So let's take a look right now. I know that there are some questions here and comments. Um, so a couple of the conflicts, past employer, family friend. So, and somebody else wrote current, uh, current employer. So for example, if I were contacted about a case against my hospital that I'm working at, that would be a conflict of interest. I would not be able to work on that case. It would not be smart to work on that case. And um, one of the sessions that Pat and I uh, spoke at uh, in the recent past, somebody asked about being a behind the scenes consultant against their own institution. And in that session, we advised that would be not be a smart thing to do. And that is a conflict of interest, whether you're being asked to be a behind the scenes expert or even the expert witness against your own institution, a true conflict of interest. Um, I think somebody here wrote a uh, family friend. Well, it would be a conflict. Well, it, it is not smart to work for someone that um, is not in the hiring position, meaning you need to work with an attorney. You can't be working with a friend um, because you are not an attorney. So the cases should be coming to you via an attorney. Uh, a family friend, it's not smart to work on their case either because there certainly can be a conflict there because you know the individual and you may not be looking at the case objectively or with unbiased eyes. Um, your own personal physician. I would not want to take a case against my own personal physician. Uh, that is a conflict. Um, can you imagine if your physician found out that you were working on a case against him and he's your physician? That is not a, that's not a wise thing to do. And um, I advise against that. Are there any others there, Pat? The hairdresser's husband uh, is something that uh, Patricia shared as a conflict, somebody you know. And can you imagine um, being trapped in that chair and if the case is not turning out well and the hairdresser is complaining about how this is affecting the family? And you're sitting there, she's got her scissors pretty close to my scalp. I don't like the way this conversation is going. Uh, clearly an awkward situation. And as a reminder to everyone, you may not screen a case for a family member, a friend, uh, a neighbor, an acquaintance. That individual needs to retain an attorney who will then provide the guidance that the individual needs, and that might be, I've got a legal nurse consultant who will screen the case, but you want the attorney to be involved. Otherwise, you can be accused of practicing law without a license. So it is not a good idea. And you will see this on listservs that people are doing this. It's a perilous position to take to help somebody behind the scenes who does not have an attorney. You can refer that case to one of your clients and you will get the attorney's gratitude, particularly if the case turns out well, and the fact that you trusted the attorney with that case goes a long way for your relationship with the attorney. But let's be clear on that. It's not a conflict of interest to do this without an attorney. It is stepping across the line and practicing law without a license, which is something you never want to be involved with. Absolutely. And true ethical issues as well. So all of these questions that we are suggesting to you today are going to help you rule out a conflict of interest and determine what the attorney needs and how you, the legal nurse consultant, can be of benefit. Then you can structure the dialogue and offer a solution. It enables you to bring to the attorney, um, bring them to the next level of action which is committing by sending you the case. 
So I suggest that you ask the attorney open-ended questions in the initial contact. So you're clear on the problem. What do you want to achieve? What would help you move forward with this case? And what role are you looking for me to participate in? Pat, can you explain the role of sharing stories um, with regard to similar cases? Sure. And before I move to that, I have seen posts and talked to legal nurse consultants who were approached by attorneys to screen a case for merit. And then to their surprise, the attorney said, all right, I want you to be my expert and I need for you to sign an affidavit of merit. Some states require that. The LNC was caught off guard because she did not see herself as an expert had prepared a report that would be then discoverable if she became an expert, didn't charge the attorney at the expert rate because she didn't think she was going to be an expert, and then all of a sudden was caught surprised over the turn of events. So that's one of the reasons why it's so important, as Barbara just said, to understand your role in the case before you get too far down that road. Are you an expert witness? Are you not an expert witness? That will govern what you charge and what you put in writing. As far as stories are concerned, one of the things that attorneys want in that initial call is some assurance that you're familiar with the clinical issues or you've worked on a similar case. If you are fairly inexperienced, you may never have worked on a similar case, but if you are clinically active or you have been recently, you may have stories from your clinical experiences. Oh, yes, I took care of a patient who had symptoms of a stroke that were not recognized at the time and there was a delay in diagnosis and treatment and the patient ended up with some pretty catastrophic damages. That would be a perfectly fine thing to say. You also need to be aware of confidentiality. If you're working on active cases that have not been resolved, then you can't share names of plaintiffs and attorneys, but you can say I've worked on similar cases or I worked on one that was settled last year and this is what happened with the case. I also have gone a step beyond that and have introduced my new potential client to a current client who's handled a similar case because then they can network, they can share experts, they can share strategy. They appreciate being able to speak to somebody who has gone through those kinds of cases. We're going to move on to what makes a client desirable, what makes a client undesirable, and what kinds of clues can you pick up in that initial phone call that this person is somebody you would love to work with? And what are the clues that you can pick up in that initial phone call that this person may be a problem and you don't want to tangle with the problem clients? So first of all, I'd like you to put in the chat, what would define for you a desirable attorney client? What are the qualities or characteristics or messages that you might hear in that initial phone call that will capture your attention? And while you're doing that, we want to focus a little bit on ethics. <laughs> Jules is sharing his opinion on the topic in Barbara's house, and he will calm down shortly. So Barbara, let's talk a little bit about ethics. Jules might have spotted the FedEx driver for sure, or somebody at the door. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, so I want you to be ethical in your sales conversations. If you have an independent practice, plaintiff attorneys may contact you and ask you some questions. They may give you a brief scenario and say, do you think this is a viable case? Well, they're asking you from the medical perspective. As I became a more experienced legal nurse consultant who's heard many, many uh, malpractice scenarios, hundreds of them, I got more work because I was able to say to the attorney, based on what you're telling me, without having seen the medical records, that does not like it, 
sound like it's going to be the best case for your practice. And you might be better served putting your resources into other cases. So that develops over time when you have worked on many cases, uh, you take into consideration your clinical background, your legal nurse background. And by saying that, that you're not, you are actually showing the attorney, you're not, you're not trying to get those records in so you can get them and bill the attorney, uh, just the opposite. You're utilizing your knowledge and expertise by giving the attorney an immediate off the cuff impression but that's based on the scenario they're giving you and you're prefacing your conversation with that clause. And the attorney would most likely say to you, I'll call you next time with a better case. I so appreciate that. And it's honest and it's an ethical answer and it gives the attorney some direction. That strategy then demonstrates the power of personal responsibility because I have expertise in that space. I realize that as a legal nurse consultant, I bring value to the table. Now, I don't encourage you utilizing that strategy unless you have the um, experience to offer those types of reactions. Pat, what are the hallmarks of a desirable attorney client? Let's look at, uh, first of all, the chat to see how people define this. Emily said, Good and responsive communication. And responsive is a key word that Emily has highlighted. When you call an attorney, you need an answer back or you send an email. Like you are looking for somebody who will respond to you. They also mentioned they don't know the medical issues. That's why they need us. They've got a level of humility. Some attorneys are very experienced some believe that they are very experienced with medical issues, but they have not worked in a healthcare environment, with rare exceptions. There are nurse attorneys and physician attorneys who I have found have a significant edge over their colleagues, but they still need expert witnesses or they need consultants who will help them so that they can focus on the legal pieces. And Anne says, a client who's clear on their expectations and goals. Are their expectations reasonable? Anne might get a phone call on a Friday that says, I need to have a neurosurgeon as my expert locked in by Monday. Can you help? That's not a realistic expectation. Neurosurgeons are hard to find, small world. Not all of them want to do expert witness work. And to get somebody over the weekend who will agree, pretty challenging. So they, the attorney might be clear on the expectation, but the expectation may be extremely unreasonable. When I think about desirable attorney clients, I think that they respect and they appreciate you. And I think that's what Emily was touching on. They don't know the medical and that's why they need us. They appreciate our value. They're loyal and they keep coming back to you for help. You're not a one and done. Now, there are some attorneys who are in general practices and they do a little bit of medical malpractice, a little bit of personal injury. They write some wills on the side. They're probably the exception. They tend to forward their cases to experienced medical malpractice firms and then get a referral percentage based on an agreement that the two law firms work out. So law firm A gives it to law firm B, but law firm A is still in the receiving end in terms of compensation when the case is successfully settled or goes to trial and is won. Other characteristics that you want to listen for and watch for is that they pay their bills on time. They don't quibble about the hours that you spend on a case. And the emphasis on that word is quibble. If you put in 150 hours, and I'm using a large number deliberately, on a case that doesn't warrant it, even the most desirable client is going to feel a responsibility to question. Experienced attorneys know it takes time to go through medical records, that you can't form an opinion or do a chronology on a 10,000-page medical record in a few hours. It takes time. 
And then they also take the long view. They understand how they benefit from keeping you happy. I got a phone call from an attorney one time who said, you know, I have an agreement with my client that he's responsible for paying the bills and he hit a rough patch and I hit a rough patch and I can't pay you everything that I owe you. Now, first of all, I appreciated that statement rather than playing the dodging game. Oh, no, he's not here. He's in a deposition. Oh, no, he's on the phone. Oh, no, he's out of the office. You know, that dodging game. And he said, I promise that I will make it up to you. And he gave me work for the next 25 years after that phone call. Did he make it up for me? Absolutely. He was honest. He was upfront. And I appreciated that. And I took the long view and he took the long view. So Barbara, we focused on the desirable clients. And I know as a orthopedic and med surge expert witness that you have attorneys who meet all of these qualities that I just went through. They love you. They pay your bills promptly. They praise you when you help them. But let's look at the other side of this. There are some undesirable clients and wouldn't we love to know during that initial phone call that there are some red flags that are going up. What can you tell us about that? Well, there's trouble ahead when the attorney attempts to talk you out of critical terms if you have a contract. There's the dictator, and it seems like an innocent enough request. The attorney's client, for example, the plaintiff, is funding a medical malpractice case, and the attorney says, you know what, I'm just going to have my client send you the retainer. He'll sign your fee agreement too. Red flag, red flag. Here's the problem. It violates our ethical codes to work directly with the plaintiff. As I mentioned before, you need to work with the attorney and be hired by the attorney. We can't screen cases for people an attorney is not representing. And if he says, oh, but you know, this is different. The plaintiff does have an attorney. Wrong. Your client is the attorney and your client has to have the funds to handle the medical malpractice case. So as the legal nurse consultant, you do not want to, and you should not have to pursue a plaintiff to get your bills paid. Pat, can you share with us about the negotiator? This is an important one for everyone to hear. And the dictator and the negotiator are close in their behavior, but the negotiator is the one who wants to pull apart your fee agreement. And by fee agreement, I'm defining a document that gives the terms of your contract, when you require a retainer, when you require a replenishing retainer, what fees you might have related to testifying if you're an expert or what is the time frame by which your bills need to be paid? I'm not talking about a rate schedule, which is different, which is typically in two columns and says how much you charge per hour for various services that you provide. I got a call from a female attorney who said, my mother was in the critical care unit and she was abused and neglected. And already I'm thinking, Neglected in the critical care unit. How is that possible? She said, I need to have you look at this record, but I saw your fee agreement and I have to object to some of the clauses. You say in the fee agreement that rates are subject to being increased without notice. I have to agree that you're going to raise your rates. Well, no, <laughs> that's not your role as my potential client. I wanted to say, does your electric company go to you and say, Ms. Levin, we are raising our rates by 10% in the year 2023. Please sign off that you agree to pay a higher rate. No, no, that's not going to happen either. We don't give our clients an option to choose the higher rate. Who would agree if you went to a client and said, I need to increase my rates by $25 an hour. Will you agree to pay the higher rate? Well, who's going to say, of course, I'll agree to pay the higher rate. You raise the rates because your business costs have increased, inflation has increased, 
and it costs more to do business. And then she also explained to me that she objected to the clause in my fee agreement that said that if there were a conflict and this case needed to be litigated, that it would be litigated through mediation. And she said, uh-uh, I would have to agree to binding arbitration in order for us to resolve conflicts. You're getting a phone call like this. You're thinking already the attorney is questioning how she's going to resolve conflict with you, in what format, and you haven't even gotten the check and the medical records. So I explained that in the past we have used a collection agency. We have not taken an attorney to mediation, but we have on rare occasions used collection agencies. And her response was, click, she hung up on me. In the middle of my explanation, she hung up with me. And I thought, okay, not a woman I want to work with in any stretch of the imagination. It's always a bad sign when an attorney starts arguing with you about your fee agreement or saying, I can't sign it, or I won't sign it or we don't sign fee agreements in our state, which is what I heard recently, which is in the Irish language called malarkey. Doesn't happen. It's up to you to define the terms of your agreement and adhere to them. And you don't want to work with somebody who's trying to negotiate your fee agreement. I met a physical therapist in New York at a, an exhibit for the New York trial lawyers. And he said to me, Pat, when they start trying to argue with me, I say, my fees are my fees are my fees. And I thought, I love that. End of story. Barbara, we've talked about negotiators. We've talked about uh, dictators. There's another kind of undesirable attorney called the tire kicker. Tell us about the tire kicker. I had never heard this term until um, working with you over the years, Pat. And it's, uh, it's definitely an interesting term, but it's so true. Uh, be aware that the attorney or the paralegal or the associate sometimes calls several legal nurse consultants. And these are what is referred to as the tire kickers because they're trying to get the rates. So you need to be very clear about what you do is not a commodity. You have something unique to give to an attorney and don't lower that to a question of a price. Attorneys should be making the decisions based on their emotional connection with you. They will make decisions um, based on the fact that You've done this before with others and they saw great results and you will get in there and you will take care of this for them, meaning that you will work hard for them. At that point, they're no longer looking for the cheapest supplier. My years of experience have brought home the saying, you get what you pay for. And that's really so true. Uh, attorneys have gone for the cheapest legal nurse consultant before and Things have changed with some of them over the times. Uh, you can certainly help them avoid making costly mistakes. Um, several years ago, uh, Pat and I heard of a group that were um, underselling their legal nurse uh, services just to take in as many clients as they could, but they weren't able to come through with the deliverables. And then as a result of that, uh, we were getting phone calls saying, we paid another legal nurse. Uh, this is, you know, this is the outcome. Now I need somebody else who can review it in full and work with us and follow through with the case. Uh, so we did receive some of those types of cases from that situation. So uh, the term, the tire kickers, uh, very interesting term. It makes me chuckle just by the term, but it's so true. Um, Pat, can you tell us about listening for transition statements and can you explain what they are? Sure. And it may not be a term that you're familiar with. In sales training, in sales calls, 
which is what you're engaged in when the attorney contacts you about a case or wants to discuss your services, you're listening for clues that the attorney's problem is well-defined. You understand, for example, that the attorney needs to make a decision about whether to take on a medical malpractice case, as an example, before the statute of limitations expires. It is very difficult to negotiate an expired statute of limitations. And I was involved in a case with an attorney where he was sued for letting what the family believed was a viable medical malpractice case. He was sued for not getting a, an expert involved in that case prior to the end of the statute of limitations. Uh, he, I ended up being deposed on that case and had to explain what we did and that we did provide him with an expert. We were not defendants in the case. We gave him a person who screened the case, who did not find the case was viable, but the attorney didn't get back to the family before the statute of limitations expired. So in that case, he faced a legal malpractice suit and he ended up having to pay that family for that case. There are also situations where an attorney has to supply an expert witness report by a specific deadline and comes to you for either you being the expert or supplying an expert to the attorney as one of your subcontractors. So you're listening for the concern that the attorney has. And then the transition statement is um, you suspect, for example, there is a case where the attorney thinks that there are medical records that are not supplied by the defendant healthcare facility, as an example. Your transition statement could be, you suspect that the hospital has tried to hide records that would support your client's claim. You need an expert familiar with the ins and outs of electronic medical records, especially the information that can be concealed within them. That's one of my specialties. So you've heard the problem, you're restating it, and you're emphasizing how you can help. When you hear that kind of problem and you frame that transition statement, then you stop talking and you wait for the attorney to react. If you think back to your psychiatric nursing days when you were taught in therapeutic communication, when you say something and you ask the question of the patient, you sit and you clamp your mouth closed and you don't rush in because you're uncomfortable with silence. In a sales conversation, those strategic silences then give the attorney the chance to pause, analyze the situation, make a decision. I'm ready to go forward with this legal nurse consultant to help me on that case. If you rush in and start talking, it doesn't allow the attorney to come to that decision point. So that's what a transition statement is. It's a pause after making a summary of what the attorney's concerns are to show that you've listened. As Barbara said earlier, you're listening, you're taking notes, you're understanding deadlines and the assignment. And then you're moving the sales conversation to the next step which can be objections. And we'd like you to put in the chat, if you would, what are the types of objections that you think attorneys have to using your services or you've heard from attorneys, These are my, this is my concern. What are the objections that they bring up in that sales conversation? And then while you're putting that in, Barbara will talk a little bit about some of the common objections and we'll pick one, which I know you're going to get. Oh, you charge that much per hour? Oh my goodness, that's so high. Yes, after transitioning from the case details, the attorney will ask your fees. And this discussion comes up most often in the first contact with the attorney. When the attorney becomes a repeat customer, you can expect less discussion about the fees. 
So the first time attorney is calling you, and that's when you're most likely to encounter that concern with those objections about your fees being the most common issue, as Pat mentioned. And I'm sure many of you are going to write that in the chat. We're looking for others as well. Note that some attorneys will be quite content with what you quote as your fee, and you can bypass this part of the conversation to then close the sale. All right. Well, then what should be your reaction when you've got that kind of a response? The attorney says, oh, Norma, uh, you're charging that much per hour. How do you react to that kind of a concern about your fees being perceived to be high? Are you looking in the chat or are you? Well, asking? I'm not going to put Norma on the spot. I picked her name because she is one of the people who has added a comment before. But Barbara, okay, what about standing firm on that fee? I mean, how do you do that? Mm -hmm. So consider the issue of the fees in the broader context. There's two risks related to fees. Charging too much, which is more than your competitors or more than warranted by your background and experience or charging too little. little. So high fees. Um, the question of what to charge the attorneys really has no easy or specific answer. Rates vary uh, based on your legal nurse consulting education, your background, what degrees you have, what is your nursing experience, what type of clinical background, how many years have you been a clinical nurse, how many years have you been a legal nurse consultant, and it's also driven by what part of the country are you working in. Uh, further, it's hard to determine without, you know, to determine what your competitors are charging or even to discuss fees without fear of being accused of price fixing. Um, so I want you to avoid working for attorneys who are offering to pay you, for example, $50 an hour or for you to work for free. As Pat mentioned before, we don't work for free. Um, I've also heard of attorneys saying, I'm going to hire you and you will get a percentage of the case once we settle or win at trial. Well, I caution you, that's another red flag. You know, you are not the partner here. That is not how we work as legal nurse consultants. And um, Pat mentioned uh, the phrase of most legal nurses work from the goodness of their heart. Uh, no, they don't. Uh, don't believe that nonsense. Uh, he's just trying to avoid paying your invoice. So you are constantly selling the value of who you are. And that means your authenticity as a person rather than your personal or professional re relationships. And look at everything from the perspective of whether it's a win-win for you and how you engage with people. Sales is about deepening your relationships and finding common ground with the attorneys. Very rarely do I ever feel like I must sell. It's a matter of listening, being present with the people that I'm talking to. It's about building a relationship. It's about finding a good fit. And certainly you need to ask the appropriate questions as well. So having all these tools should help your next sales call be a little smoother and easier. Pat, what do you think about the objections? Um, what if the attorney says to you, you know what, Pat, I'm going to think about it. And that may be a polite way of the attorney saying, I think your fees are too high. Attorneys sometimes think, can I get it? Can I get the person at a lower hourly rate? Or they sometimes think, oh, she's way under quoting her services. Why is she quoting such a low rate? Let me think about it means there's something that you haven't effectively addressed in the phone call with the attorney. You can respond by saying, tell me what you need to think about. Maybe I can help you understand or explain so that you can clear your way through that concern. So you're putting the person on the spot in a way, 
and engaging them to try to determine are there objections that the attorney has not verbalized that you can address and help the attorney understand. And then the next step of that is, all right, well, you've explained to me you want to think about it. Let's set a time for when we'll talk again. Now, this is something that most people don't do, and it would help them get through this phase of the conversation much more successfully if they kept the person on the hook. All right, let's talk tomorrow. What's a good time tomorrow? You've got a person who's interested in you. You want to reach resolution. Don't give them a week or a month or, you know, indefinitely to come to a decision before you have that next follow-up phone call. Barbara, I think we've talked a little bit about low fees and the attorneys are not going to object. At least they're not going to say, oh, Barbara, why so low? Why aren't you charging me more? You're not going to hear those words. But what goes through the attorney's mind when they hear a fee that is really way at the low end of the spectrum? Uh, so when attorneys hear this, they, wonder, they may wonder, well, what's going on here? The savvier ones might be a little bit distrustful. And they may think, is this person any good? Why are they charging so little? Do they actually have any experience? So the legal nurse consultant who sets the low, right, the low rates is inviting being treated like a commodity in the field where the competition is increasing. Inexperienced legal nurse consultants are charging lower rates because they're hungry. And of course they want the business, but they're also sending a message that their work is not of high value. So stand your ground have a price based on what you are worth. You are the one that will set the precedent for what you're worth. And maybe you'll have fewer, fewer clients this year, but uh, your business will grow over time by standing your ground. And you can utilize um, some of those prior clients as referrals for you as well for the future. And before I go to the next um, question, I just want to let everybody know to hang tight there um, in our education session, because we do have a surprise for you uh, that you're going to hear more about at the end of this session. And not only does it have to do with our Legal Nurse Conference, but it's actually something that you can get for free. So stay tuned. Pat, can you share about buying signals? How do you recognize them? Great question, Barbara. And this will be the, the last point that we're going to make in this program. And that is that you've gotten the details from the attorney about the case. You've ruled out a conflict of interest. You've made transition statements to indicate that you understand what the attorney is looking for. You now want to successfully close the deal. You are listening for buying signals. And buying signals sound like this. Who will review the medical records? How fast can you turn this around? What other services can you provide on this case? Can you go into more detail about the format that you will use when you do the chronology? I agree a timeline would help in this case. My favorite one who shall I make the check payable to? That was my most favorite, still is my most favorite buying signal when I work with attorneys. This indicates a degree of psychological acceptance of your services. The salespeople of the world will tell you when you hear the buying signal, stop selling. You've got the deal. You don't have to keep reiterating the value of working with you or how pleased you are for the opportunity to assist or anything that is designed to help push the sale forward. You got it when you hear the buying signals. When you hear that yes, then you move into the transaction. This is my address. Uh, I will send you a fee agreement. It will have my address and my EIN, employee identification number on it if you have that for your business you're moving into the details of getting the case in. 
And Barbara, before we end, we wanted to share a little bit about the conference that is taking place on March 23rd, 24th, and 25th. Can you tell our people who are attending this program or watching it later on our LinkedIn timeline a little bit about the three-day conference that's coming up? Yes. Um, we, Pat and I, have listened to you, our legal nurse colleagues from around the United States and Canada. And we've listened to your ideas and the content of what you're looking for us to go forward for new ideas for our conferences. And this is an opportunity for legal nurses to connect with other legal nurse um, colleagues, as well as attorneys, physicians, business people, as well as others. And we want your practice to soar. So our conference is designed for every level legal nurse consultant, from the very beginner to the most experienced. We want you to expand your legal nurse role. Uh, for example, you will hear about expert witnessing. Um, you will hear from an attorney as well as um, Pat Iyer, who will present an amazing program on deposition and trial testimony. Um, we have a nurse attorney and myself who are going to talk about alternative roles for legal nurses, and that includes working with your board of nursing or working with attorneys that bring cases forth to your board of nursing and or defending nurses that are going forth to the board of nursing, as example. You will hear from some of our very seasoned legal nurse consultants who are going to give you an opportunity to ask questions of them. Each of them will highlight a part of their practice and offer some great um, highlights and tips for you to grow your practice. And um, Pat, I would like you to share about one of our um, big topics for the conference, one of our keynote speakers. One of the big topics and the story that a lot of people have been talking about in the last several months is Charles Cullen, who was a ser serial nurse killer. He wasn't killing nurses, he was killing patients, often in ICU and often with IV medications. I had an opportunity to work on Charles' case for one of the prosecutors who was representing uh, the Essex County Law Enforcement and St. Barnabas Medical Center, where Charles started his nursing career as a new graduate and began killing patients at St. Barnabas, his first employer, and continued to kill patients for the next 16 years. You may have read the book, The Good Nurse, or watched the movie on Netflix that came out in October that shared the story about how Charles was caught. I helped to identify some of the victims that Charles killed in my role. That was my assignment, working with a prosecutor to figure out, we've got the killer, we know people died, how do we draw the dotted line between them so that it will stay and it will come up in court and can be substantiated. The other person in this program with me is one of the individuals who got involved in the civil litigation when the families of the people who were killed began suing the hospitals for passing Charles on to the next unsuspecting hospital, even though they had concerns about his behavior and performance they did not share that information in a way that prevented him from getting hired by the next hospital down the road. And he crossed back and forth between New Jersey and Pennsylvania in the course of his nursing career. We will also focus on business topics, including what you can do to help attract attorneys to you, how you can utilize a magnetic marketing message that will cause attorneys to say, yes, you're the person that I want to have work with you. And we'll also bring in a speaker who will share some tips on getting referrals. One of the best ways to get new attorneys into your practice is people who have been referred to you by somebody who has loved what you did 
for them. There's a whole other slew of topics that we haven't covered yet. They'll be in this March 23, 24, and 25 virtual conference. And by signing up before Thursday night, you'll have an opportunity to join Barbara and I in a 7 p.m. Eastern one hour question and answer session. This is for everyone who has already signed up for the conference and for you to sign up and be able to participate in this. We will have open mics and we will ask you to share your burning questions about legal nurse consulting so that we can give you some guidance as well as the other people on the call who may have tips that they would like to share in order to answer that question. Everybody learns in a question and answer session. And this is specifically this Thursday night on the 23rd of February, 7 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Central, 5 p.m. Mountain, 4 p.m. Pacific for one hour, a completely open, unstructured, ask us whatever you want. And we will share with you the straight scoop about the questions that are in your mind that are bugging you. So we want all of you to bring, write down your questions, bring your questions forth to us. And what is the time for the deadline they need to sign up by Thursday? Because we'll have to send them the link. Well, they will be sent, sent the link automatically. I would say to be sure that you have time for that link to get to you, I would recommend doing it no more than an hour before the program is going to begin. Uh, when you register, we'll give you that link and then you'll be able to join us on the Zoom program. The link for signing up for the conference is running along the bottom of the screen. It is lnc.tips forward slash March 2023 virtual. And that's all one word, no spaces. That will take you to the conference registration page where you can choose between a VIP ticket, which gives you the recordings a hour at the end of each day for Q&A specifically with me and all of the benefits of being an attendee at the conference. Or there is a live option and a recorded option. The live option does not have the VIP benefits. And you're going to want to be able to ask questions. Things will stir up in you as a result of being part of the networking, the support, and the knowledge that we provide in that conference. And if you have questions that we have not addressed, and we've got some time for a little bit of time for Q&A, this is my email, patire at legalnursebusiness.com. Barbara's is barbara at barbarajlevin.com. Yes, there are CEUs, Teresa, and that's on the webpage. This program has been approved for CEUs. Uh, Sarah's asking about, uh, she's responding to Lauren. Lauren's asking, what's the best way to determine our fees? Uh, the, the attorneys on the East Coast and the West Coast, the cost of living is higher on the East Coast and the West Coast. So, Laura, you should be in an area with high cost of living. If you're in San Diego, we know you're in an area with high cost of living and you can charge at the top range of the type of service that you're providing, whether that's behind the scenes consulting or expert witness work. Uh, attorneys in the Midwest typically have less cash flow and they pay lower uh, in the Midwest and in the South tend to have lower fees for legal nurse consultants. So if you are charging in the range between 100 and 150 an hour for behind the scenes consulting based on your area, your experience, you're in the right ballpark. Uh, some people charge more than 150 an hour and expert rates are typically always at least $100 more per hour because of the higher level of academic preparation, the skill, and quite honestly, the analysis work as an expert is tougher and being able to withstand cross-examination is probably one of the most challenging things that we do as experts. 
we're going to focus on that, by the way, in the conference, when I bring in two of my plaintiff attorney clients, and we're going to talk about how does the attorney plan the cross-examination? What techniques can you expect will be used, whether you are preparing experts for trial, or you are an expert, or you know you never want to be an expert, you'll get something out of that session. And I'm not seeing anything else in the Q&A, Barbara, for... Uh, this is the conference for you. If you're looking to start your practice, perhaps you're a legal nurse that's reviewed a few cases and you're looking to expand your practice, this is certainly the conference for you. Every, every level legal nurse, we have heard from so many of our prior uh, attendees sharing with us that they've made some great connections. Some of them have gotten their first cases from our conference. Others have made great connections that they've done networking and sharing experts together. So we offer great education, lots of fun and opportunities for, for some incredible networking uh, opportunities. Thank you so much for staying with us. We appreciate you being part of this event. We've given you our email addresses. If you have additional questions and we encourage you to make this investment in yourself, to take three days of your time. It's a Thursday, Friday, and Saturday is from 10 to 3.30. Thursday and Friday are 10 to 6. These are Eastern times. Take some time out. Get to know some new people. We promise you that you will learn some things that you have not heard before, and it will help you in your business development. We appreciate you being here, and thanks so much. Watch for our next broadcast. We'll be back with more topics in the future, and appreciate you being in this room with us and sharing this experience. So we want you to sign up now so you can attend our free session and ask all your questions on Thursday night. LNP.tips so forward slash March 2023 20, virtual.